Throughout recorded history, world order has been sought by every great civilization, but none have attained it. With the alleged collapse of the specter of communism, there should be nothing to impede the spread of democracy. Yet never before in the history of mankind has there been so much instability in the world. We now face global economic entropy and environmental catastrophe before the close of this decade. How can we repair the damage? Where do we go from here? To know our destination, we must retrace our steps and learn from the mistakes of the past. Are we, like the Romans, a spiritually dead civilization? What would Moses think of our interpretation of the covenant? If spiritual enlightenment has abandoned us, then where did the spirit go? Two-thirds of the world's population has a common religious ancestor and a man named Abraham. And yet we continue to oppress each other with increasing violence. We began our quest at the dawn of the common era with a Palestinian prophet and claimant to the throne of Israel, the direct descendant of David, the man responsible, by design or accident, for establishing a spiritual foundation that survives to this day. We have examined the book of Revelation and considered the possibility that Herod the Great had conceived a plan to establish world order based on Judaic law in Rome, Asia Minor, Egypt, and Babylon. Would Rome eventually fall apart at the seams? And what empire would be waiting in the wings to replace it? At a certain point, the river, out of weariness, because its flow has taken up too much time and too much space, because it is approaching the sea which annihilates all rivers itself, no longer knows what it is, loses its identity, it becomes its own delta. A major branch may remain, but many break off from it in every direction, and some flow together again, into one another. And you can't tell what begets what, and sometimes you can't tell what is still river, and what is already sea. To understand the way people think in the second century, we must consider the ideas of three men from the distant past. Socrates brings ideas to birth almost 500 years before Jesus. The intellectual and moral improvement of Athens is his goal. Socrates is wisest of all because he alone knows nothing and he knows that he knows nothing. He discusses virtue, justice, and piety. The young Athenians are devoted to him. He never really attacks the worship of gods although he essentially believes in one God. He becomes a spiritual leader, with no asceticism involved with his practices. But Socrates is sacrificed to the bigotry and the chagrin of a fallen city, having been accused of worshipping strange divinities and corrupting the morals of the youth. He is sublime in his martyrdom, and this is the ultimate spiritual triumph of mankind. He has aroused a love of truth and virtue by showing a right method for attaining truth. Socrates establishes a conceptual basis for scientific knowledge. He's not concerned with natural philosophy, but he regards ethical questions as his highest concern. No man intentionally does wrong. He must contend with powers beyond his control. And these forces sometimes compel a man to stray from right thinking. Plato reveals that the supreme idea is the idea of good, the ultimate meaning and ground of existence. The physical world possesses only relative reality. Plato's ideas, uh, Plato believes that ideas are permanent, while things of sense are changing and transitory. He argues the existence of a world soul. The demiurge, or creator, is the fashioner of the physical universe. The rational soul is immortal. Virtue is the harmony, or health, of the soul. The cardinal virtues are justice, self-control, courage, and wisdom. One must have contempt for this world. To achieve a just society, a philosopher must rule. Aristotle accepts the world as it is. A benevolent monarchy is about ideal for him. Although Aristotle doesn't favor any particular form of government, happiness is the objective here. 
a certain amount of materialism and good fortune are needed. He distinguishes between happiness and pleasure. The golden mean, which is nothing too much, is part of his ethics. But this is not the Roman way in the second century. 